Hi, my name is Dennis Kim. I'm the concert master of your Pacific Symphony. And today, um, first of all, I'd like to share a few pictures uh, of uh, two gentlemen. And um, yeah, it's uh, once the pictures come up, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about them, but they're two gentlemen that uh, we in the Pacific Symphony and, and I miss very much. Um, but uh, I hope you enjoy Today, we have uh, two very special guests, uh, two, is, uh, two newest members of our, um, of our staff um, that play incredible roles. And uh, I'm, I'm hopefully going to learn a lot and hopefully uh, it's interesting for you guys. And please ask your questions and put them in the chat. Um, but I look forward to hearing from all of you. So Russ, um, I, didn't, I didn't actually get to know him too well, but um, the few memories I have of Russ, uh, I mean, after, I mean, he, was, he would always be backstage, of course. And uh, I remember one time, you know, coming off, uh, you know, playing Scheherazade or, or one of these big solos, you know, he, he was the first one to see me, of course, off stage, like, bravo, Dennis, that was amazing and very, very supportive. Um, but he would do that after actually every concert. Um, he, I remember coming off a concert one time, uh, like, a, like a children's concert, and there was no solos, nothing. And I just came off and I was like, oh my gosh, that was, that was amazing, Dennis. Uh, and just this smile and just, just his warmth is something that I'll remember. Um, he was our librarian for many years. Uh, but before that, I think he was a horn player. And uh, yeah, he's, he's a, just an incredible person. And uh, he's, he's sorely missed by, by all, of course. And um, yeah, it's, uh, we, we all remember him fondly. And uh, we're all positive that he's in a better place and uh, hopefully, hopefully happy looking down on us. Um, and the second, second gentleman, of course, I'd like to speak about is uh, Paul Zibitz. Similarly, Paul was an incredible person. Uh, of course, he was, he was the bass player in our orchestra and, and personal manager, but he had so many other interests. Um, he was a professional poker player. Um, and just such a warm, him and his wife were, were so warm and, and welcoming to, to me and my wife and my family. We went over to their house uh, for dinner many times. Um, Paul took lots of money off me uh, playing poker, of course. Um, but uh, he was an extraordinary gentleman with so many uh, different interests. Uh, his house is, is amazing. Uh, it, it doesn't look like uh, anyone's, anyone's house that I know. Uh, I mean, he had a pinball machine in there, you know, of, co of course, a poker table, uh, a great guy, um, always there to, to try to help. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, we all miss him very much and uh, hope him and Russ are up there playing poker and, uh, and, and having, have, having, having some laughs on our, on our behalf down here. But uh, yeah, rest in peace, both of you. We, we hope you're well. Today we have um, two very special guests. Uh, we have Allison, our librarian, and Craig, uh, our personnel manager. Uh, they, they started right at the beginning of this pandemic, so I don't actually know them that well. So this is actually a chance for me to get to know them and hopefully for you to get to know them and figure out what they do uh, for the Pacific Symphony. So um, please welcome Allison and Craig. I hope you guys are there. Awesome. And look, oh my gosh, you're actually in the library. I'm uh, in the library. Yeah, and, and Craig, I hope you're not at the hall. No, in, in this makeshift apartment slash office, as it seems to be. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so first of all, uh, can you just uh, introduce just briefly uh, where you're coming from uh, right before Pacific Symphony? Uh, possibly uh, if I, I don't even know, but if, if you were in the music field uh, uh, for, for school, um, Allison, why don't you why don't you start uh, ladies first? Sure thing. Um... I attended the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of, Conservatory of Music uh, for clarinet performance. And um, while I was there, I began to intern at the Cincinnati Symphony Library. And after college, I stuck around Cincinnati Symphony for a while to be an assistant librarian. Um, I was there for five years. And then I moved on to the Austin Symphony for my first principal full-time library job. And I was there for eight years. Um, and I have been here with the Pacific Symphony since July. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a crazy time to come here, but uh, as you can imagine, 
so many people who were waiting for you to come. Uh, we have, uh, obviously, uh, even when we're not uh, playing, I mean, we have lots of things to prepare uh, for when we are able to play. And I know that you have, have been working overtime. Uh, yeah, I mean, before we get to Craig, tell us a little bit of what you've been doing during this pandemic when we've, we've been uh, kind of shut, shut out from the concert hall. Yeah, sure thing. Um, it's been kind of a different experience. And because we've moved so many things digitally, a new part of my job is obtaining sync licenses. This is something we didn't have to worry about when we were just performing for an audience. And um, it's, it's kind of complicated. There isn't a whole lot of standardization for it as there is for the licenses that we hold to perform on stage for an audience without anything extra. But as soon as something goes up on the internet or television, any sort of content that's under copyright, uh, we have to make sure that we're legally ready to go with all that music. Um, so that's taken up a rather big portion of my job. Otherwise, since we're getting really, really close to getting the orchestra back together, I've been uh, just kind of feverishly putting music together as we get repertoire coming down the line. Um, so we're, we're working on a really condensed schedule here and I'm having to work a lot faster than I would in a normal season. But it's, it's really exciting to be moving along here and actually back to music preparation and, and working with my principals to get bowings and working with Carl St. Clair to, to look at repertoire that's going to be coming up. It's, it's really starting to feel real now. <laughs> um, of course, before we get to Carl, if anyone of you who are listening today, if you have questions for Allison, for Craig or myself, please put it in the chat or the Q&A. We'll try to get to all the questions. Um, uh, and this is a chance uh, for you to ask anything you want. Um, Craig, how about you? Where are you coming from? And I have a feeling it's Kind of similar to an Allison. Somewhat. I, I, I have a few years on Allison, so it's a little bit longer. Um, but I went to Western Illinois University, and I was a music business major. Um, I also was there on scholarship for oboe. So I um, wow. played in all the ensembles, and I also played in an orchestra with my professors um, in the evenings on the side. And uh, I also minored in human resource after I figured out personnel was an interest of mine and then continued on to intern and work with the Atlanta Symphony. And then at that point I had gotten a little, I guess, philosophical about my career and decided to take a smaller orchestra gig and learn more of what the other departments had done because in Atlanta, I basically knew what operations library and personnel did, but I wanted to know more about marketing and development. So I moved there and then after that I was recruited to Baton Rouge, Louisiana for a job for operations, um, personnel, education. And then I ended up in Austin, Texas then, recruited as well for um, an operations assistant job. And then in the end it turned into a director of operations and orchestra personnel. And I was doing that for about 10 years. And then now I have been here with Pacific Symphony for what has been about a year and 15 days, I think something about that nature. First of all, of course, we're, we're so grateful that both of you are here. Um, I haven't had a chance to work with you both too much, but the little bit that I've had a chance, it's, it's been amazing. You guys are so efficient. You guys are amazing at what you do. Um, how is the Austin Symphony surviving without the two of you? My gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, they found some very qualified people to, to fill our positions and um, the, the librarian world is, is you know, I, I'm very close with all the other librarians out there and I, I know the person who got my job there and she's gonna do great. Right, um, yeah, we talked a little bit before and you, you were saying how uh, a lot of qualified people took your positions, but uh, yeah, like I said, we're, we're grateful that you're here. Um, so what do you do, Craig? I mean, Allison talked a little bit of what she's doing during the pandemic. What is a little bit di different for your job during the pandemic? Oh, it's. It's literally, I feel like my world's been flipped upside down in some ways. So much of an orchestra personnel manager's job early on in your first years and formative years is building those relationships with your musicians so that you can very much be an advocate for them when it comes to things that happen with uh, the staff and administration and with their colleagues. And, you know, now it's kind of, you know, where I would normally go do have a lunch or a coffee or a you know, get a glass of wine after a service to get to know my, my musicians and colleagues better. Now I'm somewhat limited to my kitchen and, and the Zoom meetings. So, uh, and, and then the whole work dynamic has changed too. We, I've had to become a COVID compliance officer so that now when we return to work, I can 
also remind you guys about, you know, six feet of distance and masks and making sure doors are popped open and hand sanitizer stations and all those little fun things that, you know, you never thought you would do as a personnel manager, but that's the new, that's the new world for the next few months, it seems. Yeah, no, it's, it's crazy. I mean, everyone's job is a little bit different now, but I mean, for two of you, I can imagine it's, 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 it's unrecognizable. Um, so, uh, Allison, tell me a little bit about uh, how one wins an orchestra librarian job. So it depends a little bit on which orchestra you're trying to get into. It's incredibly competitive. It's, it's on par with how competitive a playing position would be. Um, for this particular job, I had a traditional interview experience and I, I got to meet the team that I would be working with. Um, I got to meet with Carl St. Clair and it, it was a lot, of, very much like a, a traditional interview. But um, a lot of orchestras, their librarian is part of the collective bargaining agreement with their mm -hmm. musicians. So they have to imitate an audition process. Oh, wow. um, it's very much on par with what a playing member of the orchestra would have to go through. So they would screen our resumes. We would come in and take a blind test, meaning um, it was graded without them knowing who we were. We would take this test sitting in a room sometimes with 20 other candidates. Gosh. If you made it past that first round, you would go on to further rounds that were usually uh, interviews with a musician's committee of 10 to 12 people from the orchestra. And if you were lucky enough to make it to the finals, uh, you would often get to meet with the music director for that orchestra. And this is pretty typical for a lot of major orchestras. Um, I've been through a few of these and it's, it's quite the process and they really kind of put you through the ringer on them. So what, what are you, what are you testing in the test with 20 people? What, 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 what are you, are you erasing and, and drawing pencils? I mean, what's going on? I mean, sort of, there's a little bit of that. Um, they would test us on transposition wow. on what? practical things like, uh, inserting corrections into parts or copying bowings. Oh my gosh. Um, or that you would have short answer questions about um, instruments of the orchestra, what key, what clef, what is the, uh, the translation into other languages for this instrument. And mm -hmm. then we would have more essay-like questions and um, wow. kind of like um, a pop quiz. <laughs> so basically, if you're not a musician, I mean, this is a stupid question, but if you're not a musician, you can't be a librarian in a music orchestra. That's correct, yes. Um, pretty much everybody in the field has some performing experience, whether it's college like me or, or a little bit beyond that. Um, some do come from um, orchestra positions where they've, they've moved into librarianship. Pretty much everybody has a music degree. Um, a handful of librarians in the industry have library science degrees, but not a whole lot. And it's, it's really about on-the-job training. I had no idea that you had to do all that stuff. I, I mean, I was talking to you a little bit beforehand, but like the librarians that I'm used to in the past, if I need a page photocopy, that's basically, that was the extent of what they did, I, I thought. But I, transposing stuff and wow, that's incredible. Um, and yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm actually just in shock right now. And how about you, Craig? What kind, what's, what's the interview uh, process like to become personal manager of an orchestra? Um. It can be different depending on the situation. Uh, some job descriptions uh, do require that you have uh, performing experience in your history, although that's becoming less common um, in the US. It's more based on the fact that you are a musician, you have a musician's degree, and that is suffice. But in some cases, they do actually ask that you had experience. Uh, and then other than that, it can be a combination of, uh, for example, here Pacific, I interviewed with Carl and, and the staff and Eileen. And um, similarly, that happened for me in Austin. But I've also done other interviews where it's interviewing with the staff as well as interviewing with the orchestra committee. So it can be a combination. It's really, a, it's so much about having the same philosophy of how you see managing employees. And there's, it's trying to be on that same page. And you're and not just on the same page with who the artistic uh, director is, in this case, like an Eileen kind of overseeing the department, um, as well as a situation with Carl, and making sure that you see similarly on how those situations would be handled. So there's a very much, um, it's a very personal type of interview in those ways. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, just the orchestra that I've been involved with in the past, um, I don't remember all the players, but I remember all the librarians and, and all the personnel managers, because there's such a 
integral part of just daily orchestral life. Um, I, again, this, this is difficult to answer for you guys because you guys just started, but what's something that uh, Pacific uh, does differently than other orchestras? It's a question for either of you, of course. I've, I've been really impressed with how in tune this orchestra is with the direct community, not, you know, not just trying to copy what other orchestras are doing, but you know, looking at the demographics in Orange County and producing music for everybody. It's, it's really impressive. And um, you don't always see that a lot of orchestras are just trying to impress like on a national scale and, and get that kind of attention. But I think this orchestra is really, really committed to the community. It's great. No, I, I totally agree because I mean, we, we have a Lunar New Year concert, but I don't know any other orchestra that has a, a, a Persian New Year concert. I mean, that was amazing. And that's one of the, my fondest memories actually, uh, going out on stage and uh, first of all, I mean, of course the whole audience was, was Persian, but they were dressed like, like they were wearing all their jewelry and they were, they looked incredible. They smelled incredible. And the hall was just like hopping. Uh, I remember when the conductor came out, I think he was the conductor of the Tehran Symphony. I mean, it was like a rock star. I mean, people were giving a standing ovation when he, as he was walking out. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's amazing that, uh, you know, where we are in, in, in California and in the United States, I think that's, uh, like you said, Allison, I think we're, we're, uh, we're, we're trying our best to, to be relevant in all the communities. And we have such a diverse uh, community in this area. So it's, it's, uh, it's fun to be a part of. Uh, how about you, Carl, uh, Craig? I mean, and you can talk about something that's not as good as other places. I mean, uh, no, I, mean, I think that the community engagement and education program here is massive. And I'm just so impressed with the amount of work that, that the Pacific Symphony does with, with their community and education programs. I mean, I had the chance to see the wind ensemble perform on my interview and I was like blown away, literally probably because there was like 150 kids on stage. But, but just so impressed by the level of quality of the program itself. And, and I think the other thing is that the dedication of the musicians. I think when American Ballet Theater came in with the, with the world premiere of the new work that they were doing this past, I guess it was March, I guess we did that. It's the last cause we did, yep. Right? That, that the level that everyone brought to the table and that everyone was there and were dedicated to it because they saw the importance and value to it. The playing level here is so high. I think it's unique in the sense that it's not a full-time orchestra, and but it has guaranteed services, but clearly plays at the level of any major orchestra. The, the, the playing level is exceptional. Right. I mean, so uh, just not to confuse any of you out there, of course, this is a full-time orchestra. It's, I mean, very few of us have other jobs, but uh, what Craig is saying is we don't play every week. I mean, sometimes we have, you know, 15 services in one week and then we have two weeks off. So in that sense, it's not a, uh, like a regular orchestra, but no, I totally agree with you. I think that uh, since we also use a lot of and giving hundred percent in the school's concerts, in the pops concerts, in the rock concerts, because it might be the last concert with the Pacific Symphony. Um, you don't know when you get called back. So I think that level is, is uh, the, the standards are very, very high. Uh, we have a question from uh, MK Hoffman. Uh, in a non-pandemic year, what are the music librarians' um, major responsibilities during a season? So I am a music preparation specialist. My job is to have the right music in the right place at the right time. And that's kind of the easiest way to explain it. But um, the longer answer there is when the orchestra takes the stage, they're there to rehearse music, to perform music. They don't want to be worried about bad page turns that they have to worry about. They don't want to have to think about um, rehearsal systems that don't jive between the conductor and the players, uh, wrong notes. All this stuff can stop a rehearsal. So the main thing is, I'm, I'm here to mitigate those things and try to get that music to be as perfect as it can when it goes on stage. And this process takes a long time and it starts way in advance of the first rehearsal. Um, sometimes, you know, a year out, I'm doing budgeting for, for the next season. Um, and a couple months out from a concert, I'm, you know, already breaking open my boxes of music that came in from publishers and uh, starting to get to work on that circulating it to my principals for Boeing's, working with Carl to get all the markings in there that he wants, making sure the cuts and excerpts are exactly as, as we prescribed. And um, it's a process that takes quite a while leading up 
to every concert. Uh, no, it's, I'm learning, of course, so much right now, but uh, what she does backstage, even during rehearsal, I mean, there are times that in a rehearsal, we'll need a, a page turn or, or a conductor wants this and that, and she has to be ready to go. And uh, it's, uh, there are times that in the middle of rehearsal, I've walked out on stage uh, and backstage and, and the librarian's there and said, I need this to be done. And the, the, the efficiency is incredible. And we, again, we talked about this a little bit before um, we started, but uh, the level of librarians and personnel managers in America is, in my opinion, the highest in the world. Uh, it's just a different level. Um, and in other places, I think, I think they're trying to, to kind of emulate the US, but uh, I think in many places, it's not as serious. Like when you talk to Allison, she, you can tell she's very serious about her job. Uh, she, she, there's no messing around. It's, it's not like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I mean. Uh, it's, it's, it's the little that I've worked with her, it's been very impressive. And everyone uh, from Carl to the other principals have been so impressed. And so again, thank you and welcome to, to Orange County. Uh, I guess same question, in a non-pandemic year, what's your main role, Craig? So in a um, non-pandemic world, uh, main job is basically to manage the members of the orchestra. Uh, make sure that they're in the right place at the right time and to create um, an atmosphere or workplace condition that is conducive um, for them to do the best job that they can possibly do. And my job, my mindset is always is to put them at ease as much as possible and put whatever worries they have in their mind aside so that when they walk on out, and out on that stage, they are giving their best performance and then there's nothing on their mind but the music itself. Um, it's always kind of also our job to be an advocate for the musicians with management. Uh, we're basically a facilitator and a communicator in that sense um, between management and, and, and music director and sometimes their own colleagues. Uh, and then there's always the tedious type projects. We obviously start rehearsals. We make sure the breaks happen when they need to happen according to the CBA. Uh, we make sure the uh, right people are there if someone calls in sick at you know, seven in the morning on a Saturday for a two o'clock rehearsal, it's my job to make sure there's someone in that seat uh, to fill that void because you know each one of those positions are that critical to a performance. Uh, and then you got fun things like payrolls and, and doing contracts as well every year. So those are the kind of the normal day-to-day -day runnings of a personnel manager. But again, it's so much of it's about building relationships. That's really the kind of the deep, deep underlying thing that is kind of the biggest part. You don't always see it, but it's it takes time to develop those relationships. And and when it's successful and you create that environment, it just it just rises the whole level raises the whole level of the institution. I can imagine your job is a lot tougher than other uh, people in the same position in other orchestras because, like I said, I mean there, there are times where we have you know five different programs in one week. Uh, it's not, you know, just, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday concert, and you rehearsal Monday, Tuesday. Uh, here, I mean, we can have pops, uh, a messiah, rock concert, and then, uh, uh, you know, classics in, in one week. So, you know, to get all these different personnel, I mean, I can imagine that uh, it, it can be incredibly uh, challenging. Um, so another question, I guess, for, the, uh, for, for you, Allison, do you have another piece of music prepared in case something goes wrong? Um, I remember when Andre Watts was not able to perform at the last minute. So any, any cases, uh, any experience with, with stuff like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what usually happens is if a soloist has to drop out, that becomes a decision from a lot of different parties other than the library to determine what rep will take that place. Um, it often has to do with availability of other soloists, whether they're able to play that particular piece of music or if something has to change entirely. Um, what does happen though, um, particularly with orchestras that go on tour, is we keep on hand what we call dead music. And this is if someone, you know, some sort of dignitary or important person happens to die when you're on tour, you have something like uh, Enigma Variation Nimrod to pull out and play. You always keep that in your trunk when you're traveling. Um, similarly, if we had uh, some sort of world crisis happen where we wanted to play a national anthem from another country, that's you know, it may or may not be something I could pull off the shelf here, but it's, it's something that we often try to track down really quickly if we're trying to add something in last minute. Um, yeah, it's, it can be a challenge, but it's, it's not often up to me what that change will be. And I just sort of have to go with the punches whenever that comes down the line. 
Right. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, the, you're so important, but actually you don't have like actually deciding a lot of things you can't really decide on your own, uh, which must be sometimes frustrating. So, I mean, you're at the library and there's a lot of music back there. How much do we own every symphony out there? Oh, no, no, there's, I mean, there's a long way to go with that. I mean, this is a very big collection too. And uh, most of it is, is under the direction of Carl and, and a lot of the markings and, and all these parts are his. Um, but I, you know, it, it takes decades upon decades to accumulate a library. Um, you know, I'm thinking of the Cincinnati Symphony because that's where I was. They had some 7,000 titles in their collection when I left there. I'm sure it's grown by then. I'm sure places like Boston and Cleveland, you know, probably have 10,000 sets on the shelf. Um, we're a younger orchestra and, you know, there's, there's many decades left of us to play catch up to that. But it's, it's really cool because I get to break in a new piece of music if there's something we haven't done before. That's awesome. Um, okay, it's been way too serious, my gosh. So let, let's talk about uh, Craig. Uh, the silliest question or, or uh, problem a musician has had and, and come to you and ask for your advice or you to solve the problem. I'm not done. There's a lot of those over the history. Um, <laughs> I, I can think of some, so if, if you can, I mean, I, I have so I, many. I've, I've, I've had some humorous moments, you know, there's, I had an incident in Austin once, for example, where we were doing a quintet at a mall and the one musician of that quintet had not arrived yet and it was quite close and I called them and I'm like, where are you at? And they said, just give me a heads up and I can try to help you. And they're like, well, I'm in near the perfume section where you said I need to be and you're not here. And, I, and then I thought about this musician and I said, let me ask you a question, which mall are you at? And at that we, we realized that she was clearly not even at the right mall. So there was very much a panic mode to get to the right location. Was that and a then, viola? No, it, it wasn't a viola player actually, oddly enough, right? And then there was a lot of tear, tears crying and it was a lot of me just kind of like, listen, you know, let's just remember that the performance matters, right? you're here, that's what matters. So let's just kind of clean ourselves up a bit and put a smile on her face. And, you know, it's dealing with those kind of moments to kind of, you know, kind of keep things and get them back on track as much as possible. So, and I, that same musician probably had several instances like that of different sundries and often over my time there. So yeah, that, that is kind of a, a kind of one of those more common things that happens that you have to laugh at at some point in the game. Right, um, again, this is, I was on tour, I mean, this is so random, but I was on tour with the Portuguese orchestra in China. And um, we get to the hall for our dress rehearsal. And this, let's say it, it's three o'clock for an eight o'clock concert and uh, it's winter and we get on stage and it's, it's freezing. The heat hasn't been turned on. And so as you can imagine, all the musicians are complaining to the personnel manager. I was like, you know, we, we can't play in this. This is, you know, it's, it's uh, zero degrees in the hall. We, we can't play. And of course the hall said, you know, we turn the heat on an hour before the concert starts, so nothing. And players are like, we're not gonna start rehearsing until you do something. And so we're all complaining to the personnel manager and the personnel manager, and this is a hall in China. So you know, it fits 3000 people. It's one of those massive buildings, uh, twice bigger than Sigurdstrom. And the personnel manager gets two space heaters about this big and puts it behind the second violins and behind the, the cellos. And he thought that that would, that would do the trick. Um, and I, as you can imagine, I have a thousand of these kind of stories. Um, but um, uh, how about you, Allison? The silliest request you've had for a musician or, or funniest thing you've seen? And I have another story, <laughs> if, if you can't come up with some stuff. I, I get some funky things with people trying to fix their own parts, um, <laughs> rather than just, you know, coming to me, like, I'm, I'm here to help. Please come to me. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, Within the circle of librarians, we, we like to show sh share pictures with each other of, you know, look at this person who put red pen in their part. Oh no. Oh. Or look at this, this page turn they tried to fix by, by cutting halfway across the page to, to make it a twofer. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it's, it's kind of industry wide though. I don't, I don't take it personally when I come across something like that. So I had a student um, who got into like, like the new world of Japan and she asked me seriously, uh, she was in her first season there and um, so she there was there was music and one page was left empty because sometimes it says you know this page is left empty for a page turn so she drew an elaborate um, yeah 
I mean, it was, it was a full drawing and it wasn't like, like a little doodle. I mean, she, she drew something there and she returned the music in the library. And I guess said to her, you know, you're not allowed to do that. And then she asked me if, if really, if she wasn't allowed to draw on the music. Uh, so I can only imagine there's, there's a lot of those kind of stories and maybe a lot of pictures in your, in your, in your uh, experience. Um, Andrew Kempler, uh, I don't know if this is a question, but he puts Craig, uh, and I don't know what to do with that. Um, will you start using digital music devices instead of sheet music? This is a question that a lot of people are, are talking about. Um, any opinions or thoughts? Uh, both of you, Craig. Craig, I mean, this is also a, a Craig question, but Allison first. Sure. Um, I would say the technology is pretty much there, but there's a lot of things that are holding us back in the industry that if, you know, it's moving that direction. I think I'll probably see it at some point in my career where we may be more digital than paper, um, but it's going to take a while. There's a lot of factors such as how do you take a whole library collection like this and digitize it? That's certainly something I don't have time to do. So that takes like a whole nother person to do that. And then who manages the technology, you know, who, who is making sure that all the tablets are charged on the stage and that, that you know, nothing's going to die in the middle of a concert. Um, it's, I think it's more of like a, a staffing issue and, and kind of, you know, there's also a number of musicians that may not be comfortable enough with technology to move in that direction. So I, I think a lot of um, industry standards are gonna have to change, but I, the technology is definitely there. It, it could happen if, you know, there are some drastic changes made. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, but even playing chamber music right now, and it's obviously uh, much smaller scale than orchestra, I still like using music. I still like putting pencil there. Um, when I see people with a pedal and it doesn't turn and, you know, that causes nightmare, battery goes dead, you know. I, so for me, maybe, maybe I'm showing my age now, but uh, yeah, it still makes me very nervous when I get on stage and I don't have piece of paper that I can feel and there's some sweat and a little bit of dirt and uh, my tears and all that stuff uh, is, uh, is, is, so for me, I hope that the day doesn't come too soon. Yeah, um, I, I would say the Cleveland Orchestra, I talked to principal librarian Bob O'Brien, he's a friend of mine, and when he first took the job there, he mentioned that there was some really old sets of music that clearly looked like, you know, or, you know, the, the paper would start deteriorating, you know, kind of situations. And he couldn't even always replace them on stage for the orchestra mm -hmm. because there was such a history of that person on that stand, the person who had that before them was their teacher. You know, there was such a history <laughs> in the Cleveland Orchestra that they, they didn't want to give up those parts because they were afraid yeah. to give up what was to them. And it's such a critical part of their education that they just didn't want to give it up. So oh, they, they would often found very, very uh, you probably have some very old set of parts yourself that you just like, I'm not giving this up. I would never want a new one. This has got right. know, history. It's it's, it's, right. your, it's all your history of learning. Yeah, in, in my orchestra in Finland, they would put the last time they played it, uh, who was the conductor uh, and who was the concert master on, on, on the top left-hand corner of every piece of music we had. And it was, it was amazing. Um, it being Finland, I mean, there's a lot of similar names, but I mean, if we did that here, I think it, it would be incredible, even in the last 30 years. Um, so uh, I guess this is a question for you, Craig. Um, are you in charge of managing special guests, i.e. hotel meal arrangements? Any special requests to stand out without mentioning names? Unless you want, maybe no names. Well, see, I, I don't have to here, um, but I have done it in past jobs. So um, luckily I don't have to do that. I'm just the orchestra personnel. So I may, I may deal with donuts and coffee maybe at most. Um, <laughs> so, but I will say that, yeah, it can, you can get some interesting requests, you know, over times, like you could be, I've had guests have requested like uh, windows that open, um, which I think is interesting in, in really hot cities that you would request that like in Austin, Texas or Baton Rouge or Atlanta and cities that I've lived um, and food requests. I mean, things you probably would normally expect um, alcohol and things like that, that they want. I remember one, one famous cellist to was having an upset rehearsal one time and she told me that I said, well, I said, would a little whiskey help? And she was, yes, two fingers, please. So, <laughs> uh, so, so, so you get those fun requests on this. I think there's some, you get some real characters and the guest artists ended with some interesting things. I wish I had some better stories than that, but yeah. No, I mean, there's so many stories. And again, without names, I mean, there are a lot of singers who have incredible requests. 
And uh, I've heard some stories of, of certain sopranos um, going to the hotel and saying, no, I need this, uh, this, this carpet taken out. And they're like, that's not a rug, that's the carpet. It's like, I need it taken out of my room. You're here two nights, we're not gonna take the carpet out. I was like, well, I can't stay here. And so, so crazy stories like that. Um, and a lot of them have to do with singers and sopranos who are larger than life. But uh, yeah, when they're on stage though, they're, uh, they, they, I guess they, they deserve whatever <laughs> they want because they can do some incredible things. Um, you know, just in, in recent memory here in Pacific, I heard some crazy pop stars asking for a certain kind of sushi and it has to be a certain price and all these kind of things. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, funny musicians out there and who have very special needs. Some people insist on a certain kind of water. Uh, it can't be Evian or this, it's gotta be, you know, again, uh, it's, just, it's just very detailed stuff. And some, some people are that particular. Um, do, this is for, for Craig, I guess. What does Craig think are the top qualities for an orchestra's personal manager to have? given the multitude of things he has to deal with? Uh, I think these days, it's obviously you need to have a musical background. And um, I think there has to be an extreme amount of patience. Um, I think you have to be very thoughtful about any decision that you make because you always wanna be impartial and fair to everyone across the border. So sometimes it's not as easy as just giving an answer immediately, but taking the time to really think about how that impacts not just one person, but the majority of the individuals. Um, yeah, it's, I guess that's probably a big part of it for, you know, is, is, you know, is those kind of things. It's like, I mean, I've gotten to a point where like if a musician needs to vent and like I've been on phones in the evenings and listened to someone vent for an hour and then they get done and they and they and they feel better and the issue is done you know and the problem is over and it's just kind of putting that time aside for for your musicians for them to know that you're there for them that you're an advocate and that you that you're an ear for them to bend even sometimes it doesn't even need a resolution but just for them to to be able to talk to you about it uh, right i mean i don't want to answer this for you but uh, a little bit of why why craig is amazing at his job and again, I've only worked with him for a year, so I don't want to make it seem like I've, I've known him my whole life. But I think Craig likes people. Uh, I think that um, that's really important as a personal manager. Uh, I think that uh, he likes, he helps, he listens. And even if he can't fix the problem, the, 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 the attempt and the desire to try to help, that's what's, what I've appreciated very much. And my colleagues have said the same things. And uh, and that's not always the case with personnel managers, you know. Sometimes they're there uh, and they have a, they they see their their role, and that's what I'm going to do, and that that's about it. Uh, but I feel like, like you said, Craig, like if I had a problem, and I would, I could call you at any time. And uh, so this is this is this is I think uh, some of the stuff that's uh, that's special about you and and, and that position. And that's similar to Allison. I mean, it's, I feel like if I had a problem with something in the orchestra part in the library, I could just call her and, and she would, instead of like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm not in the office right now, don't call me. So it's, there's a lot of personal interaction and I appreciate, appreciate that from both of you. It must be the Austin stuff, I guess. <laughs> um, Eileen, our boss has a question. I would like to know from both of them what their roles are during musical auditions. So this is a question that a lot of people have. Uh, some musicians actually probably don't know. So um, what are your roles in the audition process here at Pacific Symphony? Sure. So um, whenever an audition is announced, it is usually announced with a repertoire list uh, from which the musicians will have to perform. It's typical for the library to provide that music to candidates and make sure that the correct measure numbers are marked to, to make sure the correct additions that are wanted to be heard by the committee are specified. Um, and in some cases, depending on the orchestra, the, the physical excerpts, um, the actual music may be provided as a packet uh, to the candidates. Um, so it, it's you know kind of similar to what I do for my orchestra anyway, making sure I have the right music in front of the right people. Um, yeah, I don't know why this is the case, but this is when you see the real skill of a, of a librarian. There's so rarely that you get music from an audition and then there are no questions. There's always something wrong. It's like, oh, you know, it's it, it written, you know, bar one to seven, but the music I got, it, it's from two to eight. 
you know, how come, and, and there's so many questions and, uh, and I'm hoping that when we have auditions again, that those will not be, uh, that will not be an issue. I'm sure it won't be with you. Uh, but in, the, in my experience in the past, I've never gotten a pack and said, oh, okay, it's very clear what I need to learn. It's like, wait, but what it says there and what music I got is a little bit different. So uh, yeah, it's, it's challenging because it's very detailed, obviously. Um, and um, yeah, I can't wait till we have auditions because we, um, you know, it's a big part of uh, our, our life here, you know, choosing new members to join the family. And this is a very serious uh, and important uh, process of orchestra life. How about you, Craig? What do you do during the audition process? Um, I will say that Allison creates excellent audition packets. <laughs> and I can say that because as the person who is in the room, uh, as part of the process is I bring the candidates in and then you, is that's usually blind. I'm the person that they have the direct contact with to answer, to answer questions. And I will say there was probably only but a, maybe a handful of questions in all the years that Allison was there that would show up while that happened and I would say probably 90% of them were people who were playing for their own parts versus playing from the parts that Allison had provided them. So um, quite often I would reference her packet saying well in the packet it says this and then therefore that fixed the problem. Uh, so it's, it's been a pleasure working with her in that regard because it does make everything go really smooth when everyone knows exactly what they're playing. Addition, numbers, etc. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the gist of it is I collect the applicants, I advertise uh, for it, I collect the applications, uh, we schedule the time slots for them, we make sure that each musician has the appropriate amount of time uh, to warm up before their audition time. Um, I also, I'm very particular about who I have helped me, because I want to make sure that those people that are helping getting musicians from point A to point B or the kind of personality that can keep a musician calm and knows how to, who understands that process and the stress of, of an audition to, to help get them from point A to B and answer any questions they may have. Um, every musician is different. Some are a little more chatty. Some are, some like to get in a very Zen position. And that's someone who's very intuitive to that. And I like to make sure that my colleagues who are working with me make sure that it's a good experience for anyone um, taking that audition process. And it's, and it's again, I'm behind the curtain. So if there's anyone that has questions, I'm the person that they whisper their questions to. And then I ask the committee to uh, answer any questions that they may have that I may not have the answer to. And then of course, I would then also work with uh, Carl and Dennis and the rest of the committee members to um, kind of you know answer any questions they may have of things that I might be able to assist with from my end um, that may help them uh, make decisions that they need to make. Uh, anything that may be relative to the CBA. Um, I'm definitely not by any means an artistic voice in any of this. It is clearly just an administrative role. It's just to make sure the process is um, executed fairly and evenly to everyone who does it. And I will say, I've always kind of felt good about my audition processes that I've done in the past, um, only because even when I've had people who have not won auditions, they've always kind of came up and said they want to thank us for a very professional audition. So I've always kind of felt good about that. And I'm hopeful to bring that same, um, not saying that it hasn't been here, but if it hasn't to at least continue that kind of, um, that kind of experience for people here uh, at Pacific Symphony with Alice. No, I mean, again, I'm going to be honest now. I mean, uh, it, we've had some issues uh, and we've had some frustrations. So I'm glad you're here to, to make our audition process um, yeah, uh, just as, as comfortable as possible for the applicants because, yeah, a lot of people are flying in from all over the world, actually, not even the country now, uh, paying big money to, to, to take the audition. So we want them to be as comfortable as possible. And once you start getting a good reputation or bad reputation, that takes a long time to, to get rid of. I know there's some orchestras, again, no names that, you know, they, they had auditions in their dressing room um, and you, you don't want that kind of stuff spreading and it's like, oh, I went there and, you know, we had auditions in the dressing room. You know, we had no warm up rooms. You know, there was there was 20 of us in one room practicing. Like this is kind of stuff that uh, hopefully is, is now no longer the case anywhere, but uh, especially here at Pacific Symphony. Uh, this is a great question. And I would like so many more of these questions. Everyone's questions are so serious. What happens at Sacred Stream behind the scenes one hour before a concert? Now, this is a great question because this is stuff that, yeah, no one would know, except for three of us, uh, of course, Carl, Eileen, but uh, some musicians don't even know what happens one hour before the concert. What happens one hour before the concert, Allison, in your life? 
I mean, of course, you haven't been here uh, performing uh, <laughs> pre-pandemic. So, but let's say no pandemic, no nothing, and it's one hour before. What, what, what are you doing? Where are you? What's going on? I mean, the nice thing about concert nights for me is um, my biggest job is just putting out the scores for the conductor. Though there's always that one or two percent of the time where I'm having to put out a fire of some sort and that's that's why I will always be here before a concert because somebody shows up without their music you have to have a library and go track that down um, if you know if there's any concerns from the conductor you need to be on hand for that person but yeah you know, it's usually pretty chill for me I don't have a whole lot to do on on a night that goes well but it's you know I'm here to put out the fires as they come uh, how many experiences do you have with people just I, I took my music home and, and, I, and I didn't bring it back. I haven't had too many. It's, oh, okay. it's happened a couple times. And I've, in those cases, I've lucked out and I've had backups ready to go. Um, sometimes it's a little more challenging. You have a, you know, a rental set that you only have one copy of. Um, and I've known librarians that have had to ask for a chair to be set out on stage for them so they can sit next to the player that forgot their part and they take a score out and they follow along in the score with that line, turn pages in the score so that player can read from the score wow. as they're performing. It's, it's happened to some of my colleagues and I'm <laughs> not looking forward to that day if it ever happens to me, but I'm here if it does. Um, silly question, but do you bring the score on stage or is that someone else's job? Yep, and in non-pandemic times, I would be handling the score for any conductor, and um, cool. that's that's so the conductor doesn't have to make a, a premature appearance on the stage. Um, right. It's me walking the score out, so that when the conductor comes out, he can come out just by himself, maybe with his baton, and just start conducting. There's not all this um, handling of paper and, and juggling things as he's going out. So, Craig, I'm sure you have lots of stuff you do an hour before. What, what's what's your routine an hour before the show? Uh, I always try to make sure I'm there, obviously, well before any musician gets there. And I also would like to make sure I'm the last one that walks out the door after the last musician leaves um, the stage area. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, for me, it's a making sure everyone showed up, first and foremost. So um, if you've gone to concerts in January through March, you may have seen me with my massive iPad that I had that um, I'm just kind of checking off the musicians as I see them. Um, being the fact that they can kind of be all over... Uh, the building on three different floors. It's really important for me to kind of be keeping an eye on everyone as they come in to make sure that I know if they've showed up and arrived uh, for the evening and uh, answering any questions anyone may have about anything. Sometimes it may be passing along questions that a musician may have for um, a soloist or for Allison for music or passing on a question that Carl may have. Sometimes Carl may request me to have a musician to come to his dressing room about something musical that may be happening that evening. Uh, and then obviously I'm the one that kind of makes sure that the, we start, uh, that musicians are on stage to start on time and then keep track of the break time to make sure that we go back on stage when we're to go back on as well. And then hopefully we're not dealing with any last minute, my car broke down, I'm gonna be 10 minute late kind of situations, mm -hmm. but they do happen and, and we figure out solutions when those when those things happen and they do. And I think only one time in Austin was it, I think I had about 10 of them when the major highway was shut down and they were about 15 minutes late. So we had to punt a bit on that one and, and do a lot of jibber jabber talking mm -hmm. at the top of the show to kind of cover for it, but it worked, it worked. So yeah, a lot of times it's putting, it's, it's mostly it's not, it's just kind of clerical, but like Allison says, sometimes the there's a fire that has to be put out, you know, at that point in the game. So I've had a chance to work in, in some cities with a lot of bad traffic. And, and, and uh, so for me, uh, in my experience, uh, if we have a dress rehearsal the day of, which we don't have here at Pacific, I would actually just stay at the hall. Um, and uh, so in Seoul, in, in, in London, uh, in Hong Kong, because you never know with, with traffic, with the subway, and I just don't wanna miss a concert because I'm stuck in traffic. Um, in, in, in Hong Kong, I would take a ferry to work. So, you know, if, if the ferries broke down or, you know, there was some delay, um, there's gonna be 2000 people just sitting around um, waiting for the concert master. So, uh, yeah, so I, I'm usually there with Craig or, uh, or earlier, I get there an hour before easily. Um, luckily I have my own room so I can, I can relax sometimes. Um, 
uh, get dressed, warm up, all that stuff. But uh, I hate uh, getting to the hall last minute. Um, as you can imagine, there are some colleagues of ours who, who get there at 7.59, but most of our colleagues get there uh, early. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, 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 it's kind of an exciting time backstage. It's, uh, and you see Carl is, has, has his routine. Um, you know, he, he has this nervous energy um, that uh, you know, it feeds off. And then he, he hugs you and he blows into this year and that year. Uh, he explained why he did it. Uh, initially, it was a little weird, but now uh, I don't think I can do a concert without it. So uh, I can't wait till that happens. With COVID, probably there's none of that stuff going on, but, uh, um, but that's what would happen during a non-pandemic year. Um, it's, uh, yeah, the lights are all down uh, and it's, 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 it's game time. So it's, it's, uh, it's exciting. Um, okay, so for you, Allison, and so I, I think you've answered it, but I think we can talk about it. What would you recommend a student study in college if they're interested in becoming an orchestra librarian? Oh, the, the most important thing is performance um, of any sort, any instrument, um, even if it's- That's amazing. I, I would never think that. And that's, again, it's, first of all, so refreshing that you understand us because you are a performer. But I thought you would say, yeah, I mean, whatever. I don't even know what you would study, like bookkeeping or, <laughs> or how, to, how to be nice. I mean, it's just uh, what, I, what I had in mind of library and what you said today is so different. And I'm so amazed and, and sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's fine. Um, you know, music theory and music history are excellent to know and, and you're going to need to know them as a librarian, but it's really about understanding what happens on the stage to know how you know, musicians interact with their parts you know, where a page turn is supposed to happen, you know, how far apart rehearsal numbers should be where it's not mm -hmm. disrupting the rehearsal because you're having to count 20 measures every time you restart somewhere in rehearsal. Um, it's, it's really just understanding how music is used by performing musicians. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's amazing uh, because I didn't know that. Uh, and that's great uh, advice. Yeah, any kind of instrument. It doesn't have to be clarinet, doesn't have to be oboe any instrument and perform because you have to understand what it's like to be out there. And if you have that understanding, I think that you would do your job differently. So that's, that's awesome. I'm, I'm so glad that was your answer. Um, okay, now this is being a little bit too, maybe what happens in the hours after a concert? Uh, that's, uh, yeah, well, first of all, in, in Orange County uh, and in America, I would say, because everyone drives to the hall, there's not that much drinking and, and partying. But I can tell you, it, when I worked in Finland, we used to have a, a bar at the hall. And after the concert, we'd all have at least one drink there. These people would walk home and uh, a lot of people live near the hall. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, of course, there are some people who, who go to the Westin and, and have a beer, have a glass of wine. But generally, I think people go home to uh, the Pacific Symphony, um, unless it's a, a special occasion. Um, yeah, I guess this is a funny question and any of us can answer. Uh, does a tuba player get paid less than a violinist because he plays fewer notes? Uh, Fiona, it's absolutely the opposite. Um, so principals get paid their, their scale, uh, section players. So a tuba player gets paid much more per note because they don't play half the concerts basically. And when they play, they play 10 notes. So in, in some ways, the tuba player is the smartest. They get paid per note much more than the violinist or the flutist or, or you know, or the pianists are the worst. I mean, they play so many notes and they, they you know, it's, it's uh, but in all fairness, yes, uh, a tutti player, uh, so a, a section and rank and fall, file, they call in the UK, uh, that, that, that's one salary. And then there's an assistant principal and, and principal. So that's how it works. Uh, so to compare like the principal tuba and the principal flute, they get paid the same salary uh, in most cases, of course. Uh, every orchestra is a little bit different. Every country is a little bit different. But uh, that being said, I should mention this. In Finland, the first violins got paid this much more than the second violins. Can you imagine that? Uh, I don't know how that they worked. And again, it's so insignificant, but they really uh, put that in the contract. And uh, I, I thought that was very funny. Because if you look at it like that way, then the cello should pay a little more than the, the basses. And then, I mean, where does it stop? My gosh. So. Um, this is a great, you're gonna love this question, both of you. What type of staff do each of you have? <laughs> so judging from their response, I think you know the answer, but please go ahead, <laughs> Craig. 
from my perspective, uh, none. So my, the, if I would get so sick that I wasn't able to do it, then of course, um, my boss, Eileen, who, who, is, who has done the job, who would be, who would do an excellent job would step in if something happens. But I can tell you, like, I think I missed, uh, like the 10 years in Austin, I think three services maybe. And they were kind of two or summer gigs with like quartets and one was one day for a vacation. And otherwise, if it was like, and Allison can attest to this, if I had strep throat, then everyone just stayed a distance away from me and I did my job. I had hand, foot, and mouth disease once, oddly enough, the weirdest thing to have. And, and I was backstage with walking like I had broken feet and broken hands, and, you know, <laughs> they're all swelled up. But nonetheless, I was there and I did my job. So it's, you know, for me, it's so much about like, I, I want to be there. I want to know the orchestra, that there's consistency in this person that no matter what happens, you know, this person that I've relied on is going to be there for me. And so it, as much as is, it would be nice to have staff and maybe in some ways, it's also for me, it's very much, I know how I want my musicians treated. And, and so therefore I want to be there for that. That being said, if, if he gets COVID, he will not be coming to work. That is uh, <laughs> Allison, uh, what's your staff look like? I am a library of one currently, uh -huh. um, which it, considering that before this position, it was part-time librarians, uh, a couple part-time librarians. So um, to have a full-time librarian in this position is actually, I think, quite the upgrade for this library. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, you know, it, at some point we've grown enough that it just needs the dedication of a full-time person. And it's, you know, it's, as we get back into it, it's, it's pushing its limits. And, you know, there, there may come a day that I need to hire out some help just to get Boeing's done, that kind of thing. But yes, it's, for now it is just me here. You can buy all the first violins of beer, but uh, we've gone to management a lot saying we need a full-time librarian. So uh, yeah, when, when we get back to work, you can buy each of us a beer. Um, that being said, the, the orchestra up the street, they have four librarians and that was amazing. Uh, I was doing a rehearsal there with Orly Shaham and yeah, I had nothing to do with the LA Phil, but I, I needed a photocopy. So I went to the library. Uh, first of all, I thought they'd be like, how'd you get in here? But uh, they didn't ask any questions. I said, uh, can I get this copy? And there was four people in there. And I was like, oh my gosh, what's the budget of this orchestra? So uh, one day, uh, maybe you'll have three colleagues joining you, Allison, and, uh, and then, uh, yeah, ho hopefully we can all dream. Uh, and Craig, you can have you know, 10 people working under you and you can basically just sit there and smoke cigars backstage. Um, uh, I guess it's very specific, but Allison, do you catalog your music? What cataloging systems do you use? That's a good question. Um... I prefer the numerical by acquisition method, meaning whenever we get a new piece of music that's played and needs to go on the shelf, it goes at the back of the collection with the, the last number in line. Um, this is, makes it a lot easier if, say, if you get a brand new Beethoven symphony, you don't have to try to fit in this, this giant set, you know, this big, doesn't have to fit in with in between, you know, your eight other symphonies on the shelf. And you don't have to shuffle things around and make it work. So it just it goes last in line, and you just keep building from the end there. No, it's uh, I mean all those details. Uh, if if you have questions, uh, and if you really are thinking of becoming a, a music librarian or, or or a personal manager, I think that you can you know email the the symphony, and uh, I think they'll they'll help you, anyone who's who's looking for that kind of career. I mean to answer some questions. Um, Thank you so much, both of you. This has been an amazing hour. I mean, I, I actually learned so much. Uh, I can't wait to, to be backstage in person, talking to you and, and working together and uh, asking you stupid questions and uh, you know making your life difficult. Um, but uh, like Allison said, I really feel it's, it's just around the corner now and it's, it's so exciting. Uh, I know uh, so many people watching today are, are so excited to, 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 for us to be back on stage also. Um, and it, it was really an, an amazing, fascinating hour because this is the first time we didn't have any clips of music and stuff, but this hour went by so quickly. Uh, thanks to all of you uh, for your amazing questions. Uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was fantastic. And, and I hope you guys enjoyed it because for me, I learned a lot. Um, once again, welcome to uh, Pacific Symphony. Uh, welcome to the family. We are so grateful both of you are here. And we hope you don't ever leave. And uh, we hope that we can get back on stage very soon. Thank you all so much. And I will see you next week. Thank you, Dennis. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.